Audio Renaissance presents Working with Presence, a leading with emotional intelligence conversation with Daniel Goleman and Peter Senge. I'm Daniel Goleman, and I'm here with my friend Peter Senge to talk about organizational learning and the cross-connection between Peter's work in that area and my own on emotional intelligence and leadership. These are two different lenses, I think, Peter, really on the same kinds of critical behaviors in an organization and a team and an individual that make such a difference for the quality of the work that's done and for the quality of being of the person while they do that work. First off, in your own terms, what is organizational learning? Well, there's many levels for understanding. Simple, but pretty complicated idea like that. The simplest, though, is just to take our most everyday notions of learning. Learning is a process whereby a human being or a group of human beings enhances their capacity to do what they want to do. So at one time, you and I learned to walk, and we learned to talk, and we spend our life learning about human relationships and how to be a parent and how to be a son or daughter. These are all learning processes. You know, we're engaged in developing capacities to ultimately, it may sound a little technical, produce an outcome that we really want. The outcome obviously could be uh, something quantitative and visible, or it could be something quite subtle, like learning to be a better meditator. But that's all learning process is. And organizational learning just kind of takes that to a aggregate and says, well, organizations that are continually enhancing their capacities to create the kind of outcomes that people, their members really want to create is learning. What appeals to me about organizational learning as you've made it a a community of practice is that you really have begun to identify specific processes, specific ways people can act together to enhance their ability to learn together. What are some of those? Yeah, this has uh, always been the central territory of our work. In some sense, it's the core out of which we continue to evolve and move in different substantive domains. But there are at least three core processes that seem to be fundamental for the capacity of, and you could say this of teams or larger networks or whole organizations to continually learn. The first has to do with the quality of aspiration. Every organization has goals, but usually it's one or two people's good ideas for what everybody else ought to see as a goal, as opposed to really having a sense of collective aspiration. We're doing this recording in a building that's had many great symphonic and other, you know, musical performances. You don't build a great symphony orchestra unless there's a group of people who have some common aspiration, which at some level is aesthetic, and it's very personal, and it's what it means to create great music. It doesn't matter what the conductor's goal is, ultimately. It's that ensemble's common aspiration. So there's this capacity to aspire in any work setting when it gets right down to it. There's lots of problems, and there's lots of issues, and how we talk to one another is core. So we've always regarded the process of conversation as a fundamental determining aspect of whether or not learning is occurring. We're talking all the time, but of course, most of the time, we're talking at each other. I'm trying to convince you, I'm listening just as much as I need to in order to hear where you're coming from so that I can somehow get you on board with whatever I want to do or whatever I think is the right point of view or whatever. The difference between talking at one another and talking with one another is a very fundamental distinction in human relationships. And it's a first order determining factor in any working team. Most meetings are a waste of people's time, and they'll tell you that. (laughs) I've always found that. And the primary reason is people say, well, we didn't need to have that meeting. You know, it was just a bunch. Everybody was saying what we already knew they were going to say and tell us what they were already doing. Occasionally, you know, people leave a meeting and go, geez, that was an incredible conversation. Something's really changed in me. I see things I didn't see. I have a sense of connection with one another that you know, maybe we can actually do something here. It reaffirms our sense of possibility. That's the difference between talking at one another and talking with one another. It's uh, what you call dialogue. Very often when people uh, in a meeting disagree, for example, what you do is you either attack or you defend. You don't have a dialogue. In a dialogue, and I like very much this suggestion from your own work, what you do is you present your position and then you enter an inquiry with someone. Right. Rather than just trying to, you know dig in and defend it. What, what is that process of inquiry? Well, first off, it's important to, to kind of recognize that the options that normally play out, as you say, are attack and defend. But there's another one that's, if anything, more common, which is say nothing. I mean, one of the reasons we find most meetings boring is we don't feel there's any space to differ. 
you know, the boss has said what the boss thinks or somebody in, uh, who's kind of in position of power. So we're often in a state of complete withdrawal because we feel if we really spoke honestly, we would just evoke that kind of attack, defend dynamic. So another way to say it is what sits in between withdrawal and aggression or just defending my point of view. And I think the key to that is the capacity to have the courage to speak the truth but to always hold my truth as contingent, is not definitive. Um, That's where inquiry starts. You know, inquiry in some sense is a fancy way of saying I really don't know. If I think I know, there's nothing much to inquire about. So if we're inquiring together, then we can co-discover, we can generate together a truth or an insight. That truth or insight can be better than what any individual one of us can come up with. There's a saying, I think, from Japan, all of us are smarter than any one of us in the sense that we all bring something special to the table, something unique, a perspective, understanding, experience. Right. So there's two aspects of this, too. I, I think that, in some sense, the ultimate criterion for judging a conversation is what happens as a result. So there's the aspect of the discovery, the listening, the sense of a new awareness starting to bubble in the conversation, But then if we put this into any organizational context, any team context, any work context where people are trying to do something, then it's perfectly appropriate to also say very pragmatically, and so what? So you had a great chat, so what? I think there's really a a dialogic theory of action or theory of change. It's actually quite old. I think we've lost sight of it, but I think it's this coming together to think together because we know only then can we act together. It's this harmonization. Doesn't mean we agree, but this kind of harmony. Keep in mind, harmony is produced by different sounds that aren't the same, right? So it's this harmonization of our thinking so that as we are moving into action, that can be a foundation. Things don't go the way we expect. They never go the way we expect. They're always one of the key issues. So what happens when there's a screw-up? What happens when something doesn't work out? Well, if there's an underpinning of real thinking together, I'll come back and say, Dan, hey, this screwed up. What went wrong? Rather than, Dan, you know, what the did you do? That You know, you just got a totally different orientation. So you're not coming to attack the person. You're coming to understand together yeah. what went wrong and what can we do next time or what yeah. can we do to change it. That's the part of dialogue that people often miss. They think it's just about the better conversation. It is. But ultimately, it's also about this connectedness in action. I remember a case study that you've described in, in your writing it was the development of an entirely new automobile at a, one of the, I guess, big three automakers. There were th- a thousand engineers working on the project, and there was a classic situation in that each team, and there were many different teams, I guess there was the drive team and the power team and the tire team and whatever, was making adjustments to optimize its own particular factor, each one of which meant someone else would have to compromise or change. So in other words, in order to do their best, people saw themselves as having to make a problem for someone else. And this was within a learning organization context, or I guess at some point it came in, because things got better once this other process got going. What what was the story there? Well, you've characterized it very well, and it's very common. It isn't just automobiles. It's all kinds of teams. Uh, There's a lot of um, lip service paid to being a team, But if you look more closely, in that case, you have people who are all different kinds of specialty engineers. They'll spend most of their career in their engineering specialty. They'll get promoted in a promotion track as a drivetrain specialist, a noise and vibration specialist, a uh, electronic system specialist. They'll come together to work for one, two, three, maybe even four years at the most on a common project. But they have their own lingo they have their own professional association. They are really a professional subculture. And yet they're supposed to be a team. So this has always been a huge problem in organizations, and product development teams are notorious for this kind of sub-optimization you were characterizing. And it's perfectly understandable if you look at it from the point of view of these people, you know? They've got a boss in their specialty group, and they're going to say, gee, how well was that drivetrain designed? And, oh, yeah, the car is fine, too. But believe me, they will look at that. And the other thing that's really tricky is that the success of the whole, let's take it as an automobile, how do you know the car was well-designed? Well, you know in 10 years. 
you know by the lifetime warranty cost. A poorly designed car will cost an automaker a lot in warranty. It'll cost the customer a great deal of hassle. But when do you find that out? Years after the car is launched. So there's all kinds of factors that work against this uh, ideal of we're all in it as a team to build the best car. On the other hand, that is what people want to do in their level. So you've got to first tap that aspiration. You've got to get them to kind of recognize that that really does matter to them. And it, it does. I have no question that it does to most people. As uh, Dr. Deming used to say, all people seek joy in work. They really want to have a sense of pride of accomplishment. But there's a lot that conspires against it. In a project like that one, there were a couple areas of real skill that really needed to be developed. One was, in this area of conversation we were talking about a minute ago, how can they balance advocacy and inquiry? How can they have a conversation about a complex process with a lot of different points of view and not come unhinged? I mean, I've seen meetings where people were throwing chairs at each other. I mean, they literally come unhinged. And the second area of skill was, what does it mean more conceptually to see the whole? Because we all have this deep knowledge of our piece, but we don't have a way of putting the pieces together. That's what we've always called systems thinking. It has to do with how people together can kind of see the elephant as opposed to just their piece of the elephant. It seems to me that one of the generic obstacles to this process of organizational learning happening is what you could call groupthink. That is collusion with the standard way of doing things, not looking at the whole, just protecting our territory, not noticing that that's what we're doing, not naming that this creates problems for other people. I've in my own thinking, talked about four attentional rules that apply in any human group, and they're modeled on what happens in the family. In any family, you learn tacitly, no one tells you, but you learn very powerfully, A, here's what we notice, B, here's what we call it, C, here's what we don't notice, and you can't even name the fourth rule, because if you don't notice it, there are no words. And every time we enter an organization, which is a family of sorts, we're socialized into the same rules. Here's how we do things here. The corollary of here's how we do things here is here's what we ignore. Here's what we don't do. And people are very quick learners for this because it creates a kind of a pseudo-harmony. We're at least getting along even if we're in fact creating deep problems. So I see is what you're doing through the learning organization quite radical in those terms because you're challenging the unstated assumptions, the hidden mental models, the things that guide us, this unspoken norms that keep things from working well here. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. I think one of the premises of all this work is that conflict is really productive if you learn how to harness it. Because while it, on the surface level you can have this pseudo-harmony, below the surface there's a lot of conflict. So first off is how do you kind of bring that out, and then, of course, then the second is how do you bring it out productively. And there's also a conflict between people with different, for example, degrees of tenure in an organization. It's quite common in all kinds of organizations to some sense keep on the periphery new people, either people because they're too young or perhaps people because they uh, come from a different background and you're not really sure you quite trust them yet, people of different gender, people of different ethnicity, wh whatever defines the core versus periphery. And a lot of ways also to pierce through, of course, that pseudo-harmony is to get the voice of the periphery. Because the periphery will have less invested in that facade of where yeah, we're all really the same here. In terms of the emotional intelligence work, this really resonates. In emotional intelligence, there are, there are four domains of ability. There's self-awareness. There's managing emotions. There's empathy, knowing what's going on with the other person, the other party. And then there's effective action, social skill, you could say. And I think that the learning organization exemplifies emotional intelligence at the group level. I went back to the work of a colleague of mine, Vanessa Druscat, who's at the University of New Hampshire. She studies top performing teams. These are teams that by any metric that applies are in the top 10% of effectiveness of productivity. And she says that she's found that they tend to have common norms, common unspoken operating rules. And I wonder if these sound familiar to you. One is to encourage all group members to share their perspectives before making key decisions. What you're saying is not to marginalize people, to let everybody have a voice, to handle confrontation constructively. If a team member falls short, call them on it 
but by letting them know the group needs them. In other words, not attacking them, but bringing them in and yet naming the problem. Treat each other in a caring way. Acknowledge when someone's upset. Show appreciation and respect. Does that sound familiar to you? Yeah, I do recognize those ideas, but they're also a little problematic. To me, they're a little bit like a snapshot, looking from the outside at something we can observe. But the really the deeper question is not what are the characteristics of high-performing teams, it's how do you create high-performing teams. That's the core management task, or you might say the core leadership task. And that's a little bit more difficult to talk about because that's a learning process. That's another way to describe the learning process for a team. And it's always uh, somewhat idiosyncratic. That's one of the difficulties from a research standpoint. You can get more real agreement on what it looks like to be masterful than how you get to be masterful. And part of that is because we all learn to walk in our own way. We all learn to talk in our own way. Learning is a very personalized process. And a group will go through whatever the group grows to. But if I've gone through it with one group and I try to walk the next group through, step one, step two, step three, the way I recall it happening for the last group, I'm dead. It'll be determined by the circumstances, the practical challenges people face, the diverse personalities in the group, the history of the group, the context of culture and, and technology and so on and so forth. So you might say, well, you just throw up your hands and say, well, I, you know, I pray to the gods that we'll learn. <laughs> so we've tended to kind of try to approach this in a pretty simple way. One, to acknowledge the difference between characteristics we might ascribe to high-performing teams and actually having the ability to develop such teams. Two, to recognize it is idiosyncratic. There's no formula. There's no three steps. But that there are certain tools and principles. And like any area, whether it's music or dance or learning to build a great working team, there really are certain principles. And that's where these three domains I was talking about before of aspiration and conversation and understanding complexity are really helpful. And I think a lot of the work over the years has been just basically to identify different tools that people use so that, you know, you have to practice, 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 and practice means tools. I'm very intrigued by a, a tool that you're exploring more recently in your work, something you call presence which is part of a process of shifting, in a sense, your way of knowing. From the emotional intelligence point of view, it has to do with uh, the self-awareness, with noticing, with the ability to pay attention, and a certain mode of paying attention. And in my own work, I found that leaders who were able, for example, to articulate a, a vision or a mission, to set priorities, which relates to your first circle, in a way that resonates with people in the team, always seem to have a habit of taking time for themselves. Walking the dog, going for a swim, one guy would go for long drives on his Harley, meditation, whatever it may be, but it's kind of a, a way of stepping back. And in your new book, Presence, you quote a friend of mine, old friend of mine, the late Francisco Varela, who said, to see freshly we need to suspend ourselves from our habitual stream of thought. Then we can begin to see our hidden assumptions and mental models. We see our seeing. Or as David Bohm put it, normally our thoughts have us rather than we having them. What is presence? Well, it starts with just what you're describing. It starts with, again, building a capacity. You know, in any developmental subject, there's always a difference between kind of lucking out and riding the bike once and having a capacity to ride the bike. So it starts with this commitment to developing a capacity to be more able to suspend, as Francisco described it. And the word suspend, actually, I first heard that from David Bohm many, many years ago. And he used to say, well, here's what suspending your assumptions mean. He said it's like hanging your laundry on the line. Now, you can tell it was quite a few years ago because David still remembered people hanging their laundry on the line. He said, you can't get rid of your assumptions. Assumptions might change over time, but it'd be like kind of getting rid of your finger. We have our assumptions at any point in time. The problem is we don't often know that we have our assumptions. So I react to you, I react to a situation as if this is the way the situation is, rather than being able to have that little bit of discernment and say, well, Dan said that, which led me to think this. Yeah, I really am assuming that he doesn't like this idea. He didn't actually say he didn't like the idea. Dan, is that what you meant? Now, that's a real simple little illustration, but nine times out of 10, 
you say something, and I immediately go into my reaction, my habitual reaction, my advocacy for why it's wrong. No, you're wrong. It's not a bad idea. It's a great idea. And you're sitting there going, but I didn't even think I thought it was a bad idea. So we tend to be reacting to each other as we expect each other to be again. Otto Scharmer calls this downloading as the most common kind of pattern of interaction. We're downloading our respective assumptions about one another. In a sense, it's tape recorders talking. It's my tapes talking to your tapes talking to my tapes. It reminds me of a distinction that Martin Buber, the German philosopher, made decades ago, which is between relating to someone as an it or a you. He used the formal term thou. In an it, you're just rattling it off. What you do, what you say, your communication has no feedback loop with the other person. It doesn't matter how they react. It doesn't alter in any way what you do, what you think, how you feel, what you say. In the you relationship, you attune, you empathize, you constantly are monitoring the impact of your words, and you're using that input to reflect on what you do and say next. That's a different kind of communication. Yeah, it very much is. And it quickly bridges over into that other term you used before about empathy because there's the kind of cognitive listening, responding, really hearing what you're saying, really hearing it. What you're saying is really influencing how I'm thinking, not just evoking or mechanically reactivating my own assumptions, but I'm actually hearing it. But then, of course, there's that next deeper level where I start to feel it, you know, oh, I can see this is actually really painful for you. Oh, I can see that, you know, you feel really stranded here. Nobody's really on your side of the table. I heard what you said, but I didn't quite feel it. That's really the second part of any process of real presencing, is you you have to first start at that auto, Sharma often calls it the open mind, that kind of cognitive interaction. But then if you stay at that point, there's still a real limit because we're not yet starting to walk in each other's shoes very fully. And at that point, when we start to have that open heart in the relationship, then there is another level of communication, obviously, that starts to occur. And ultimately, which is where we're all headed with this, a deeper capacity to collectively sense the situation. Again, not just the cognitive, but the emotional sensing. And ultimately, to sense at the deepest level which is, so what's really trying to happen here? What's the purpose that brought us together? Is this just a random deal that you and I happen to be sitting here or this team came out the way it is? Or does this team actually have a purpose? These are words and ideas that are always a little bit difficult to express. You could call it a destiny. The words ultimately don't matter. But there comes a point in the creation of a great team when people actually, you can almost feel like a switch turn. They go, oh, this is what we're here to do. And when that sense of purposefulness really starts to be evoked, there's a a level of power and efficacy that never occurs otherwise. Yeah, it sounds galvanizing. Yeah, absolutely. But on the other hand, I could imagine someone listening to what we're saying and have the kind of reaction that this sounds a little squishy. Do people actually do this? (laughs) Do do people actually go through this kind of a process in in a business? Well, if they want to have a great business... So uh, the answer is yes and no. No, they don't most of the time, and that's why most teams are pretty mediocre. That's why most businesses are pretty mediocre. Keep in mind, we got into this whole, quote, organizational learning business, which is, by the way, a term we never used for the first 10 years or so. We did all this work in dialogue and systems thinking and shared visions. We never used the term organizational learning until it was pointed out to us, actually, by some of the companies that started to get drawn into the work. Well, there was actually a real big issue here, that the vast majority of really large, successful wealthy, talented businesses don't survive very long. They don't learn. I remember reading um, Andrew Grove's very candid book about his years at Intel, where he's talked about the valley of death that a business can go through, where all of a sudden you're blindsided by competitors or there's a vast unforeseen change in market, and you may be stranded. A business can die. He said in the history of his uh, being CEO at Intel... There were two episodes that he described. One was in the early 70s when they were just making chips, computer chips, and they didn't realize that the Japanese were stealing their market. And there were signals. Their people in Japan were saying, something's changed here. The Japanese aren't treating us with the same respect they did before. Something's going on with our customers. And he said, 
that if they had not happened to have a secondary business, which was making microprocessors, Intel inside, they'd be dead today. It was just a lucky break for them. And then there was the time when they released the Pentium chip, and there was a drastic flaw in it, and they had to recall it. And, uh, you know, everybody worked day and night over Christmas and New Year's, shipping out new chips. It cost them a half billion dollars, but here they are today. And he says when there is a moment like that, how the top team responds, whether they freeze or they uh, panic, makes all the difference in the world. Peter, in your book, Presence, you describe another top executive at Intel, David Merrick, who uh, was under the gun. He was heading the development of a new fabricating plant. It was going to be the biggest of its kind in the world at the time. Things weren't quite working out. He went through, coincidentally, I gather, a life-threatening illness. And as a result of that, he had the insight that what they needed to do, as he put it, was to slow down, to speed up. And he introduced in their meetings, the management meetings, kind of a meditation break, some kind of contemplative practice. And in fact, they finished in record time, and the plant paid back in record time, too. It seems so counterintuitive. How did that work? Well, it seems counterintuitive when we describe it in this kind of way, which is very understandable. You know, well, we're going to go slower to go faster. We're going to work less to get more done. I mean, that all sounds very, very bizarre. But that's because it doesn't really get at the deeper issues. In David's case, he had had a career at Intel, and he was in this job, as you said, where he was responsible for the ramp-up of what became the largest semiconductor fab facility in the world. You know, it was a very stressful job. He was working around the clock, around the week, and he said, you know, he didn't even notice it because he'd worked like that for most of the last 18 years. He said, I remember after all this incident played out, he said, I realized, you know, ambulances would periodically pull up at the uh, facility, and we didn't really make much note of it. And what happened is he had a heart attack. He was fortunate he got to the emergency room quickly, and there was very little long-term damage, but it was one of those moments he was not an old man. He was about 38, I think. It was one of those moments where he had a chance to really think and what really mattered to him. When he came back five or six weeks later after taking a break, longer than he really needed to, because he really, he really saw the opportunity to do some rethinking. He also, by the way, they had their first child, which I think she was about a year old at that time. His wife, Vicky, also worked at Intel. So they could kind of live with the whole package. They were both Intel employees. He came back, he told people, you know, from now on, you'll know how to reach me on the weekend, but I expect you won't unless it's an emergency. I won't be home. We actually had a second place they could go to a couple hours away from where they were living, and we spent on taking our weekends and relaxing and being up there. He said, I'll be working, but I won't be working here. And I just want you to know that we're going to end most days around 6 or 7 o'clock. And all this seemed heretical to people. I mean, they basically thought to themselves, well, that's it. We don't have a general manager anymore because that's not the way a general manager behaves, particularly not in this situation of this extreme pressure. Well, as you said, they ended up accomplishing a lot of things nobody had ever accomplished before at Intel. And David's reflection on the whole thing was real simple. He said, you know, I realized after another six or nine months went by and I saw how the team was really working differently that we were substituting effort for intelligence We were just working harder and harder and harder, but a lot of times we actually weren't talking about the right things. We weren't really focused on the key issues. We were talking around problems. The things we were talking about a little earlier, Dan, of the quality of the conversation wasn't there. And I just thought that simple phrase really captured a lot. We were working harder and harder to substitute, in a sense, effort for intelligence. I think there's a tremendous amount of waste in most teams. People in organizations, particularly manufacturing organizations now, are really into waste, but they're talking about physical waste, measurable waste, process waste, you know, excess inventories, maybe even an ecological, environmental waste. But I think there's an extraordinary amount of waste in the way we interact. You know, when we waste people's time in a meeting, notice that's what we say. We wasted our time. That's waste. Hard to quantify it, except when you go through this kind of change and a team starts to work very differently and suddenly you realize that it's done something nobody's been able to do before. So then you have a little quantification. But I think it does come down to developing a level of awareness and a level of confidence. That empathy we were talking about, if it's mutual, you get a level of confidence that we really can stop 
the circus. You know, we can stop the thing in the motion, say, wait a second, hold on a second. I don't think what we're talking here is what we really should be talking about. Or I'm not sure this is really the way we should go. Are you? And all of a sudden, the conversation drops to a different level. The real conversation starts to occur, and the waste goes out. So I think if you think about just with that metaphor alone, how much waste there is in our normal interactions, you can start to see how you could actually slow down and, in effect, speed up. Reminds me of a story that Freud, of all people, tells about a Japanese gardener because he used it as an analog for the job of the therapist in psychoanalysis. He said that he knew a man who hired a, a gardener from Japan to build a Japanese garden in the back of his house. And the Japanese gardener came, and every day he spent eight hours a day there just sitting in that place, just getting to know it deeply. And then after some months of this, all of a sudden, he very, very quickly made the most beautiful garden. And it can work like that, can it, Peter? That if we really sink down into what you call the valley of the you, where we first descend from our ordinary, caught up in the wasteful, mind-spinning mode of thinking, that we sink down into a deeper knowing, and then attune from there, then we can execute much more effectively. Right. And in line with our circumstances. Because what he's doing over that day after day is he's attuning himself. He's taking in the reality of that space. He's paying attention to the winds and where the light is and, you know, what's already growing there. It's actually a wonderful kind of generic characterization of the Eastern versus Western approach to creating things in general. I remember my first trip I ever made to China. I had a good friend who actually flew over to the United States to accompany me. It was a lovely gesture. We'd known each other for a long time. He certainly didn't need to do it, but it meant a lot. And we sat down the airplane, and he handed me a card, and I opened up the card. On the cover of the card was a beautiful photograph. It was a, a lily, which was kind of almost decaying, it was sort of half bent over, long stem lily in this bent over, but sitting on the, on the break where the stem bent was a beautiful red dragonfly. It was just a stunning photograph. I opened up the card and I read his inscription. And he said, my father, Dr. Han Ying Yang, who is a very famous photographer, goes to this lily pond. He goes for six days and on the last day, he takes one picture. So there is a really a very uh, interesting set of paradoxes here. This is a, perhaps an extreme way to characterize them, but I don't think it's inaccurate. It's that ability to be attuned, that ability to slow down enough to actually have some awareness of where we are and what's going on. And that line of David Marsing, you know, substituting effort for intelligence, had a lot to do with that. People were simply not very aware, in a sense, so they had to work hard. But the more aware they became, the more they could actually focus their actions on just what needed to be done, as opposed to lots of other stuff, which basically you're doing to impress your boss or impress somebody else, or just show everybody how hardworking I am. It reminds me of some data from neuroscience about what's called maximal cognitive efficiency. In the work on presence, you describe a you that sinks down, but this has to do with a bell curve which is an upside-down you, and it's the relationship between stress or wheel-spinning effort, the kind of thing people do when they're substituting effort for intelligence, and real intelligence. And there's a kind of balance point in the brain where you're alert, you're calm, and you're very clear, where the brain optimally takes in information, processes it, and understands it deeply, and then can respond most creatively, flexibly, and effectively. And it's not a mode that I think we pay enough attention to cultivating. I think presence is a way of encouraging leaders, encouraging teams to get into that mode and then act from it. Right. And, and there's an individual and collective aspect. It's very hard to cultivate this capacity for presence in a group where nobody has it individually. So at some level, perhaps the analogy to a, an artistic ensemble, a music group, a dance group, is right on. 
you know, you have to have talented, competent individual performers. If they're not committed to developing their own personal mastery of their instrument or their dance or whatever, nothing else really matters, but it's not enough. There is also that collective attunement and that ability as a group to kind of sense and to be more aware of what's there. And ultimately, as we often say, to really even have a sense of what's really needed, what's next. And it's that next phase of a lot of the work that could potentially connect the neurosciences and management will be on really understanding collective attunement and the fields that can be evoked collectively amongst people. Because when you talk to people who've been part of a great engineering team or a great music ensemble, it doesn't really matter, any great sports team, invariably you'll get to these incredible stories and people will start saying, well, yeah, you know, time slowed down and everything moved totally differently. And, you know, we didn't know what was going on except we knew with 100% confidence it was going to turn out. And, you know, the meetings changed and, you know, they could be totally chaotic and we could be having arguments. But everybody walked out of the meeting with 100% confidence that this was going to be a real success. Whatever. Everybody always has their stories. So I, I think there's a very real phenomenon here. I recently met a, a man who's a Japanese Buddhist monk who left his life as a monk. He said he had been ordained, and he was in India for about two years with his next stage of his study. And he said he had this incredibly clear experience that the era we lived in now individual cultivation was not enough, that there needed to be something really like collective cultivation. And I think there's a lot there that we're going to understand much deeper, I suspect, in the next decade or two. Actually, I think it's already begun. In the last five years, there's a newly emergent field in brain research. It's called social neuroscience. And it's about the way brains attune, brains harmonize, quietly, out of our awareness, but very effectively. They've discovered, for example, you mentioned a musical ensemble and how people, when they're really on, have almost a collective flow state, time changes and so on. Some of the work that was done with musicians showed that, for example, two cellists playing the same piece, the right hemisphere, the hemisphere that's following the music, doing the music, across the two brains, the right hemispheres are in greater coherent harmony then are each of the brain's right to left hemisphere. In other words, there's an invisible field, and they've discovered another fascinating connector of, of beings at this level. It's called mirror neurons. Mirror neurons act like neural Wi-Fi. They quietly and effectively read the emotions, the motions, and the intention of the person we're with, and they activate in our brain the very areas of that person's brain that are operating to do what they're doing. So what we have is an internal sense of where the other person is. And when we attune, when we are in the IU mode, then we maximize that. The thing that takes us out of that is very interesting. It's self-preoccupation. Mm -hmm. When we are attuned only to our own concerns, when we're tuned to our own fears, our own determination to make my point, win this round, whatever it may be, we focus on ourselves and we tune in minimally to the signals from the other person. And there's a continuum from utter self-preoccupation on the one hand, where we only treat the other as an it, to utter attunement where we not only sense the other person's state, but feel with them. And if they're in need, we automatically help. It's the stance of compassion and it's maximal attunement. And I think that we all go back and forth along this arc, but in order to get into that state that you're describing where teams really feel, yes, that was a great moment. Yes, we're in this together. Things are turning around in the best way. I think that people are collectively attuning, and it's this kind of invisible network that's going on. And in the moment when there's a real problem in the room. There's something no one is saying, but we're all knowing. Every mirror neuron in that room knows what's going on. We just aren't speaking, and it creates internal tension. When we suppress something like that, it actually changes our physiology. It raises blood pressure. We know this now from studies, and everybody else senses there's something off. 
So one of the things that I think goes on too often in a meeting is that there is something that needs to be said that isn't recognized, but we all feel. And it's like the elephant in the room. That's an enervating meeting. It's not an energizing meeting. It's a meeting where you're going to feel sapped afterward or what a waste because we didn't get to the real point. One of the beauties, it seems to me, of the principles of the learning organization is that it allows naming that and dealing with it. Well, it's really interesting. I think there's no question that this is an area that's really going to be crucial in the future. But I'm also really, really intrigued by what you're saying in terms of what it means for our collective functioning, not just our individual learning. Because I think, you know, this term elephant in the room has become a a popular one. And I've watched a lot of organizations who have uh, adopted the term. There's a few consultants who made it very popular. And I have to say, I haven't seen much difference. In other words, quote, naming the elephant in the room, or to be more accurate, talking about naming the elephant in the room is not the same as naming the elephant in the room. But secondly, just to name it is often not enough. It's a little bit like, you know, maybe it's the very, very first step. Without that, nothing much can happen. But very often at that point, there's a whole new level of self-preoccupation that comes into play. So finally, you know, the dam bursts and I say, well, look at Dan, you're the boss, but you know, you don't really know what's going on. Let me tell you what everybody knows and you don't know. Okay, I've now just named the elephant in the room. But when I do it in that fashion, there's obviously a fair amount of anger. There is retribution. There's all these things which are very much anchored again in me not us, as opposed to someone saying, you know, I think there's something none of us are saying. And it's probably because we're a little afraid. And, you know, I'm a little afraid. Now, there's a totally different way of doing the same thing. But it puts my own state out in the open. So, you know, that old paradox about what do you do with self-preoccupation, right? (laughs) You become more preoccupied about yourself until you just say it until you can really acknowledge it cleanly and simply. It's like that first principle of meditation. You can't make your thoughts go away. You just open the door, they go away on their own. But you just gotta pay attention to them. And then they move on. So there's an important set of capacities in here, which are not well captured by, quote, naming the elephant. It has to do with who I am when I'm naming the elephant. Am I me accusing you of not having seen the elephant because you don't wanna see it? Or am I me recognizing that I'm stuck, we're all stuck, and, you know, let's just acknowledge that and then see what happens as a result of that. So there's some real subtleties in this domain, but I I think that when we take those kind of acts, you might say, of vulnerability, there's an interesting, it would be an interesting subject to kind of explore if people haven't already. My experience is when any one individual in a group makes an act of being vulnerable, something shifts. It's subtle, but it's small. And then if a couple more people do it, all of a sudden you can feel the shift. All of a sudden, you know, in kind of a way of a lot of people traditionally would say it, the heart is in the room, not just the head. And at that point, my guess is all that potential social neuroanatomy starts to come back into play. But it's ironic because we do it in a sense by acknowledging our own position. But we're not preoccupied by it. Maybe that's the distinction. I think it's the how it's done, and I'm glad you make that point because it's, you know, you can use an understanding of all these things defensively or Machiavellian fashion for your own ends or constructively. And the constructive mode, as you say, is to name your own feeling, identify this is in me. I'm feeling, you know, I feel a little funny about something and it makes me a little nervous to say it, but here's what it is. That's very different than being accusatory or being angry or defiant, and it makes me think of implications of um, the social connectivity of the brain for leaders. You know, there's a disparity in emotional contagion and the directions in which emotions flow. The mirror neurons and all of this connectivity makes us share emotions in any room all the time. We may notice it, we may not notice it, but it happens. People in any human group pay most attention to and put most importance on what the most powerful person in that group says and does. What that means is that the boss's emotions and expression of emotions amplifies enormously. And I just read a study that showed that this is most true with negativity. 
that people end up being preoccupied. If you ask them about the time their boss criticized them, they'll say, and I thought about it for days. People ruminate, they get preoccupied, they get fearful. In other words, it means that leaders need to be even more skillful in how they express these things because of the unintended, perhaps, negative impact on the other person's brain and their ability. You know, if a leader is just going to end up making the person who feels criticized anxious, you're diminishing their capacity for cognitive effectiveness. And you depend on them. Mm. We depend on each other for our success. So I think that the kind of dialogic approach that you're describing is of special importance to leaders. Yeah, there's no doubt about that, and I think that's true at the level of a team. It's true at the level of an organization. I, I remember years ago, we were doing exit interviews with a group of CEOs we knew. We did this for a year or two. It was a lot of fun. You know, after being on a job four or five, in one case, uh, 12 or 13 years, there's a window of time when people are just leaving the job where they have very rich reflections. And I'll never forget one guy who had been the um, CEO of a very large company, a Fortune 50 company. I think we caught him in his last week, maybe his first week of retirement. And he had this most interesting comment. He said, well, so Phil, what, what did you learn? And, and he had been very effective. The company had had record losses when he came in. And it wasn't just his effort. He would be the first one to say this. But his good fortune and his effort combined, you know, they were making record profits by the time he left. He said that, well, what I learned that was most surprising to me was at certain crucial moments when I could tell people I didn't know or I didn't have the answer, it opened up a tremendous amount of space in the organization. He said, I came in at a very difficult time for the company. You know, we'd actually had layoffs, large-scale layoffs for the first time in our history. And everybody kind of got this, you know, hero on the white horse mentality. Phil's going to come in and save the day. Phil's going to have the answer. You know, this kind of wishful thinking, which is a big part of what often goes on in hierarchies, this love-hate relationship we have with our bosses. Anyhow, he said that I didn't have the answer. I had some ideas, but I didn't have the answer. He said, when I could tell people, I don't really have all the answers. He said, I could see, and it was genuine. It wasn't Machiavellian. He wasn't just trying to manipulate them into taking more responsibility. It was the truth. He said, he can't do it often. People don't want to hear that all the time. He said, but there were certain crucial moments when I could see the entire organization step forward and people go, oh, we have to think about this for ourselves. We have to see what we're going to do. So I think that the emotional intelligence of leaders, this kind of goes without saying, it, is absolutely crucial. I think it's a very tricky territory. I know it's one that you've thought about a lot because on the other hand, if you get too overly concerned about hurting the feelings of the people on your team, then, of course, you have a new level of self-preoccupation, right? How do I, you know not tell the person what I really think. Well, of course, the other side of that was all those mirror neurons. We have a pretty good idea what each other thinks all the time. We certainly feel those emotions. And when, when someone's withholding, we know it. So I, I think that kind of is the doorway into a territory of a lot of skill and competency, how to be honest and yet not beat people up, how to share my, my emotions but share them in a way that's ultimately constructive, how to be attuned with others without being overly protective of others. And I think this is really kind of the basic territory of good interpersonal skills in the domain of management. But the more you rise in a hierarchy, the more crucial it becomes. The more crucial it becomes to not just say you don't know, but to invite answers. Not just say you're doing it wrong, but let's work together and find a better way. In other words, you know, one of the classic tragedies of promotion to leaders is when someone who is an outstanding individual contributor, fantastic individually, gets promoted to the head of a team or a division or sometimes a company, and they don't know how to lead except by giving orders or setting an example, do it like I do, and then become impatient and micromanaging, instead of shifting into a mode more like you're describing, where you're able to speak from the heart and come up with a collective sense of mission that people resonate with or to really be consensual in the best way where you invite people to help you understand. And a friend of mine who's with a global executive recruitment firm said that they found that 
looking at people who they'd recommended who did very well versus this is at CEO levels and, and top management versus those who uh, washed out eventually was that people were basically hired for their business expertise their ability to get things done and fired for a lack of emotional intelligence for lack of a sense of how to get everybody in this together how to use the group at its best and you point really there to a pretty basic flaw which is as we're guiding people in their career rising up the hierarchy oftentimes organizations are simply not set up to provide the coaching the mentoring the support and the discernment as to who really has those higher levels of emotional intelligence one you know very simple way to kind of frame this issue that's been very helpful for us over the years is that in a well-run organization as you get higher in the organization the nature of the issues are in fact getting more complex less black and white really embedded in very difficult short versus long-term trade-offs in other words you can do a lot of things that'll look real good in the next six months but really could be quite disastrous in five or six years and these are by their nature subjects which require collective intelligence yet we're promoting people by and large because of their individual intelligence and it's that gap that, that shows up again and again and again because we're just not paying that close of attention to the capacity to evoke collective intelligence because at the level that people were operating it it was useful but not critical it's always useful but sometimes it's not critical but you're not dealing with those same types of issues when you get to the more senior level those are the core issues with which you are dealing and it now becomes absolutely the life or death and that's why you have so many you know of these CEOs who are full of themselves and make great speeches and are very impressive at the investors meetings but we talk to people inside the organization they're lost they feel no sense of confidence there's tremendous divisiveness because they don't know how to create that environment or they're having heart attacks or they're having heart attacks you know I'm struck by um, listening to you about leaders and highly effective leaders what mentoring may mean in light of social neuroscience because you noted that mirror neurons are what children rely on to learn in the first five years of life. That's why children can be such voracious learners, because mirror neurons map continually what's going on. And so kids model what they see. Language, social rules, how to ride a bike, all of these things. In part, you're learning through your insatiable learners, neural learners, the mirror neurons. But it doesn't stop in childhood. It goes on through life. And one of the ways they operate is when you come into a group, they tell you what the unspoken rules are here. You learn it through your mirror neurons by modeling what we do, what we don't do. For leaders who are realizing that one of the main tasks of a leader is to develop new leaders, this, I think, says something about what mentoring really entails. Because if you take someone with you through a critical incident, how you handled that upset client, how you marshal a team together to solve that creative problem, whatever it may be, just by being in your presence, if you're highly effective, I think people get by osmosis what it is that made you so good. It's not like you have to do the hard thing of stopping, figuring out how to give words to what you do automatically, which actually is a difficult process. Right. Uh, it's what artificial intelligence does, and there's a high art to doing it well, but you can't map everything you do. We know more than we can say, right. but you can show someone, and their mirror neurons will pick it up. Well, if you think about it, if we were limited by what we could say, we wouldn't really learn very much. That phrase you used a minute ago, Dan, we know far more than we can ever say, is almost exactly the way Paul Yanni originally expressed the idea of tacit knowledge. He said, we know far more than we can tell. And I think it's a very important idea because to think that our knowledge, our capacity, our totality of what we're capable of can somehow be reduced to words is kind of ridiculous. You can't even describe how you tie your damn shoelaces. How the hell are you going to describe what it means to deal in a very complex interpersonal conflict when you've got to have a group of people come to some collective action in six hours? I think it's so crucial to understanding the nature of learning, that so much of learning is this kind of tacit to tacit coupling. 
And yes, it's useful to be able to verbalize, particularly, I think, at the level of kind of principles and stories, the two things that seem to be the most useful. Obviously, stories are often very, very important. And occasionally, we can kind of really step back and articulate a principle, which is no substitute for the learning, but sometimes can really deepen it and solidify it. One definition of mastery in any domain is not only that extraordinary tacit knowledge, but some appreciation of how you do it. Not a reductionistic one, step one, step two, step three, but one that would really illuminate for someone who said, ah, I see. I remember years ago, I had a friend who did a fascinating PhD. She was really interested in conflict and conflict negotiation, and she picked three of the most accomplished negotiators in the world in totally different domains. One guy was a, a famous systems family therapist, so his negotiating domain was families and conflict. Another was a management guy who worked with management teams, and the third was a large-scale negotiator in big social conflicts. She studied all of them. It was a horrific thesis because it was at least 10 times as much work as anybody should try to do. She had 1,500 pages of transcribed notes for each of the three. The main thing she learned was absolutely none of them did what was in their books. They had all written extensively. I remember one guy had over 30 books he'd written. She said, but when you got to this situation, you done what you did, and here's what I observed, and then she got him to reflect. He said, oh, yeah, yeah, when that happens. She said, but you've never written that. And he goes, no, I've never written that. <laughs> but that's what you do. <laughs> so this tremendous wealth of tacit knowledge we have and how that transfers, if transfer is the right word, how we come to appreciate that is really quite crucial to the higher levels of learning. And I think in organizations, you know, again, I often see the tremendous waste of people's time, a little bit of time where you could just hang out, you know, go through a difficult meeting and then have a half hour to hang out afterwards or dinner afterwards where people can just kind of talk about it. It'd be worth its weight in gold of, uh, you know, a thousand hours of management training. I think one of the messages I'm getting, Peter, in talking with you is the value of opening up space, mental space, chronological space, to unpack things a bit, to yeah. give room. And one of the things you're giving room for is presence, is this deeper mode of knowing. And I remember a terrible board meeting that I sat through where the CEO and, and a couple of people were just having a, a very tense, bitter dispute. And it was very upsetting for the whole board because we'd never really had that kind of thing happen. And everyone was very kind of stymied by what to do with it. But what we did was very interesting. The next meeting we had at a board, we held at a meditation center. Mm -hmm. And we started the meeting by just having a half hour of a guided meditation. We had someone on the board who was happened to be very expert at that, and who led us through. And lo and behold, like that Japanese gardener, I guess, we were able to very deftly resolve what had seemed to be an irreconcilable situation. And I think that presence has extraordinary value. Yeah. I think this is something that is intuitively understood by a lot of gifted leaders in all kinds of different settings. But it's very hard to talk about. One of the reasons I think it's hard to talk about, Dan, is that we tend to focus very much on what people do. Okay, so how did you solve that problem? You know, tell me what you did. Whereas the doing part of it really might have been almost trivial. But what went on behind the doing, so to speak? You know, what went on in, in people's kind of coming to awareness? Last fall, after the uh, need to evacuate large numbers of people after Hurricane Katrina, they were actually shipping evacuees from New Orleans all over the United States. It was a pretty chaotic situation. I mean, literally, people would get on a plane at, at 12 or 1 o'clock at night, and they didn't even know where they were going. One group was brought to Massachusetts, and they set up a center at uh, an old Air Force base on Cape Cod, Otis Air Force Base. And there were about 500 people from the Ninth Ward in New Orleans, which is one of the hardest hit and poorest parts of the city. And I went down to visit there for a while because a good friend was made the, quote, mayor of Otis Air Force Base. The governor of Massachusetts asked him if he would do this. He's a Baptist minister. 
in Cambridge, who's just an extraordinary guy. And he's done a lot of good work over the years in Boston on juvenile crime and so on. So anyhow, his name is Jeff Brown, and uh, Jeff was the mayor of Otis Air Force Base for, I guess, was six, seven weeks Why the people were there. One story he told was really, his stories were amazing. I mean, of course, the traumas that people had gone through, you know, the loved ones they'd lost, the uncertainty about kids, you know, they had people there, you know, who four or five weeks later still were missing two or three children. They didn't know what had happened to them. Anyhow, so there was a guy named Fred who people were quite concerned about. And after four or five days, one of the uh, other people from the Ninth Ward came to Jeff and said, Jeff, would you spend a little time with Fred? We're all very worried about him. One of the things that was quite interesting about this setup is they actually had a lot of people there from the same neighborhood, so they actually knew each other. Their, their neighborhood had essentially been transported 1,500 miles. Jeff goes over to Fred and sits down with Fred. And Fred basically um, hadn't talked to anybody. That's why they were so worried about him. Four or five days ago, but he hadn't said a word. Jeff sat down with him and sat on this little bench and they're looking out across the dusty field at some trees and Fred says, well, hi, Reverend. Jeff says, hi, Fred. That's all he said. Jeff said, I sat there, he said, probably 45 minutes or an hour. At the end of that, Fred turned to Jeff and said, it's been good sitting with you, Reverend. Fred went over and ate lunch. It was the first he'd eaten in a week. There's so much that can go on between human beings. It has nothing to do with what we say or what we do. And I think it's the, the subtle territory of leadership that has been understood in some ways for thousands of years. It is the quality of being, if you want to use that language. It is the capacity to have that I-you or I-thou relationship, as you were talking before. It is the person's presence. And what does it mean? I mean, he was just there. I mean, Jeff sat with the guy for 45 minutes. And I said, Jeff, what was it like? He said... Well, we just sat. It was no big deal. I mean, but he could be there. He wasn't anxious about it. He somehow knew that that's actually what Fred needed. Fred needed somebody to just sit with him. And then Fred could start his process of returning to normal life. That reminds me of um, a study that you describe in the book Presence, where a community was looking at the quality of medical care, and they distinguish a continuum of uh, doctor-patient interactions. And the first is the all too familiar I it where yeah. you're the diagnosis. Let me fix your problem. Yep. And uh, you're not a person. The last was the one where the doctor gets to know the patient as a person, spends a little time, jokes with them, asks about their life circumstances. And the tragedy is that when you ask the patients, as they did in the study, well, what do you usually get? It was the first, the you're your diagnosis, you're the number. It's the accountant's mentality telling doctors you don't have the time to get to know the patient as a person, even though just maybe a minute or two. And then you ask, well, what kind would you like to have? And it's the other one. We all want to be known. We all want that kind of presence that happened with Fred. And I was talking to a, a woman, a physician, who was a resident at a Harvard Hospital, and she came into medicine because she wanted really to have that kind of presence with patients. And so she's in rehab medicine, and she'd have someone come in, and she told me about the case of a woman whose daughter had a terrible arthritis, and she had been going to a chiropractor, and she would get momentary relief, maybe a couple of days, and then she'd have terrible pain again and go back. And what she needed was a pretty simple medical procedure, an injection and then some physical therapy, but the mother and the daughter didn't understand. And this doctor took the time to answer all their questions, and it took about 20 minutes. And at the end of 20 minutes, the daughter and the, and the mother agreed to go through the procedure that would actually help her. And at the end of that time, the doctor's supervisor comes in and says, what are you doing? You can't take this much time with a patient. We're not set up for it. And the irony is that we're not set up for it, even though we all want it. And even though research on malpractice suits shows that if a doctor takes the time to know the patient, answer the questions, joke a little, put them at their ease, these are the doctors that don't get a malpractice suit. Mm -hmm. And others do. And these are the doctors that patients stay in a health plan for. 
and they flee the other doctors. So even though the system is suffering from a lack of presence, it can't quite get itself to acknowledge that fact. And I think the same is true in schools. I think it's true in businesses. I think it's true in, in government. How can we make the case for presence? Well, you can't correct the absence of something. In other words, if you go back to what we were talking about, the mirror neurons, I think everyone who has developed some capacity for presence or being present, in part is because they've had that experience. They have been in the presence of people who were good at it. Then you can orient towards doing it. But to just say, uh, well, we don't have the time and we have a problem of not having enough time with our patients and we need, at some level, it's a very simple distinction. You know, it's a difference between solving a problem of not having enough time versus creating something that we want to create. People go off and try to have all kinds of relationships because they're trying to solve the problem of not having a relationship. Right? as opposed to actually being with someone that they want to be with. In one sense, it looks like you know playing semantic games, but it's not semantics at all. One is you're trying to solve a problem or eliminate something or correct something you don't like, and the other is you're oriented towards something you want to create. And that something has some reality to you. It's very difficult, of course, to talk about things like presence, except insofar as it evokes in people their own experience of it. Then all of a sudden, go, ah, of course I know what you mean. It was that teacher who somehow, you know, they knew me. And then you orient towards that. So there's an old saw in the creative process, you know, the most single most important thing in the creative process is knowing what you're trying to create. That doesn't mean you've got it all figured out. You certainly don't know how you're going to do it. And its manifestation might be quite different than what you're imagining in some ways. But that's really the principle of vision at some level. It's knowing what you want to create. And to me, it's that mirroring that we were talking about earlier is obviously playing a very important part. I find most doctors also, not only most patients, want the same thing. They want to have relationships. They want to feel like they have been of real, genuine service to someone, not just at fixing something, not just even getting them to reflect on the behaviors that they have in their life, but even deeper, why they have those behaviors. We could call it a transformative interaction. They happen all the time. I think part of the idea of starting to write about presence is to, again, talk about something that's tacit. The problem is it's tacit for a very small number of people, and it kind of sits on the periphery of our attention for a lot more of us. I think it could be much more present. I think we've had lots of experiences if we could just kind of tune into them where uh, we actually slow down just enough to pay a little extra attention. And we were attended to in the same way. That is a human moment. That's a right. moment of connection. And I think that one of the common colds of social interactions in our society today is the split attention. You know, if you've got your Blackberry and you're on your email and you've got your cell phone with you and of course, we should put aside the cell phone, turn off the cell phone, stop right. your email, forget the BlackBerry, and attune and actually be there, be present. I think we want that individually. I think we want it collectively. I think we want it in the whole social field. Right. And I think we have to recognize how important it is. You know, one of the oldest themes in science fiction writing is the machines are taking over, right? You can trace that theme probably for almost the history of the industrial age, certainly for the last 100, 150 years. And they are. Because exactly what you're describing is the human's rhythms being dictated by the machine's rhythms. You can keep speeding up machines. I mean, that's one of the goals of technology in all different kinds of ways. Make it faster. Make it work faster. We consider that convenience as a user. You can't do that with human beings. Now you can bring your work with you on the family picnic. Yeah. on the vacation, it breaks down the barriers that protect our private life from our work life. But, but again, I don't think fighting it is a very particular effective strategy. You know, like solving the problem of what to do about my BlackBerry. The higher leverage strategies, in my experience, always go back to, well, what is it that really matters? And how do I orient myself? You know, like that flower to sunlight. How do I orient myself? in the direction of what really matters. Now, along the way, they're going to have some problems to solve. It's not like, you know, life becomes nirvana instantly in the sense of no problems. But I think that's why, again, these kind of conversations where we evoke those moments in a relationship, in a work setting, in a doctor-patient uh, interaction, in anything, 
in the last conversation we had with a kid where we actually listened or were listened to. They orient us, and we desperately need that now because the machine, and I'll use that kind of metaphorically here, is relentless. You know, it doesn't give up. I really do think that theme in the science fiction literature is right on the money. It is relentless. How many hours a day are people plugged in? I had the opportunity about a year and a half ago to sit to uh, participate in a dialogue for two and a half days with a native group, and I now get to do this periodically. And I thought to myself, wow, this is like the big leagues. I'm going to hang out with the people who live dialogue. And I'll never forget the way this elder started off the meeting. You know the first thing he said? He said, we've come here to unplug. And then he just proceeded to say what you and I have just said. We're all plugged in. It serves a lot of ends. It has a lot of conveniences to it. And it's probably not like we want to throw away all these gadgets forever. But if we don't develop the discipline of unplugging, we're in trouble. You use the phrase, uh, a sense of purpose. And I was very taken by something that you write about. It's something called the Marblehead Letter. And it was the product, I gather, of a, a weekend or a long gathering of people from many different corporations to reflect together. And the letter was to their own companies, I guess, to their own organizations. And and it starts by saying that a natural agenda of issues is shaping the future, especially for corporations with global scope. And the issues that it names are the ever-widening gap between rich and poor, Uh, It's put very strongly. For how long can 15% of the people get 85% of the benefits of globalization? A redefining growth so that economic growth takes into account its environmental impact. Inclusiveness, diversity, who is the we, diminishing the us-them divide. And uh, accountability for corporations. And then the system seeing itself. How can we stop going faster while dimming the headlights? So I found that quite a moving set of issues and rather surprising for a corporate group to engage. How did that come about? What was that meeting like? Well, that was the output of a conversation that wasn't the input. In other words, we didn't start off with those ideas. It was a group of people, most of whom knew each other pretty well. They were either uh, in senior Uh, management jobs or probably four or five of them had retired from those kind of jobs in the last three or four or five years. We start off just kind of talking about, well, what's the state of our work, all this organizational learning work. It was a very open kind of uh, conversation in a lovely setting by the ocean in springtime. And that was really the synthesis that came out of the meeting. And people wanted to have a summary so they could actually take it back and show colleagues in their organizations that they weren't the only ones who were concerned about these issues. It's funny, as I listen to you go through it now, Dan, it's been a little over five years since that meeting occurred. It actually seems, I don't know what the word is, dated is not quite the right word, but it's like, well, of course. Now, I think it's probably in part reflects a rather self-selecting group of people I'm around, because I'm around basically people all the time who, these are all the issues they care about. There's a a sea change occurring in the business world, particularly the large global businesses around the social and environmental unsustainability of the way we're going at things. I think it's changed so much in the last two or three years that it's almost impossible to predict what it's going to look like another two or three years. People are waking up to the fact that not only are there issues of this sort, because surely we all know about the social inequity issues, the, uh, uh, what does the World Bank say, the bottom quartile of the world's people has seen their share of income, global income, fall from two and a half to one and a quarter percent in the last 25 years. I mean, we all have heard these statistics. Climate change, carbon accumulating in the atmosphere, the state of the health of ecosystems. We've lost topsoil in the world's agricultural areas equal to the size of China and India combined in the last 50 years. And on and on. So we've all heard these things. But I think what's changing now is there is a kind of gestalt that's emerging, a kind of sense of the whole, that these aren't isolated bits and pieces. This isn't a waste problem that this particular company should go and clean up. This is us. This is the large-scale manifestation of the kind of inner disconnection we have in our own lives. To the extent you and I are no longer connected to one another, to the extent to which you and I are no longer connected to where we live, the place, the air, the water, 
we live this out on a large scale and look what we've got. We have this kind of disconnected consciousness. There's a medical term I always forget, you may know it, but it's where the mind does not know what the hand is doing. <laughs> and that's literally, I mean, our handprint is all over the planet. Our mind is totally unaware of that. The daily choices you and I make affect the lives of people on the other side of the planet. This is crazy. It's a gestalt of an awakening, I think. And the Marblehead letter was a wonderful articulation of that just at the beginning when it was starting to form. I know all those individuals. I think I know pretty much where all of them are today and what they're doing. And they're pretty engaged. And they have a lot of people in their organizations who are pretty engaged. It's going to take that. It's going to take extraordinary engagement. The wheels are coming off the train of the global industrial process. People, I think, sense it, feel it in their gut. But we haven't yet started to put the pieces together. What does it mean for me? What does it mean for my company? That process will take a while, but it has begun. That's a hopeful note, Peter. And on that note, thank you very much for joining me. My pleasure. We hope you've enjoyed Working With Presence, an original audio renaissance production. This program was produced by Hanuman Goldman. Text copyright 2007 by More Than Sound, LLC. Production copyright 2007 by Audio Renaissance, a division of Holdspring Publishers, LLC. All rights reserved.